so I'm, um, I'm here to tell you a little bit, uh, remind you about the core technology in Algorand and then uh, whatever is coming, you know, um, uh, just the next month. So the blockchain um, um, uh, promise really everybody knows about it. Who doesn't like, you know, um, uh, a database which cannot be altered? Who does not like uh, transparency? Who does not like the ability to generate trust among the people who barely know each other. You know, the applications are uh, unlimited. But somehow, a little bit of a, we must also remind ourselves of a constant challenge that we have between uh, aspiration and uh, technology. And uh, I believe that uh, as humans, uh, we need to push our aspirations higher and higher. But also as humans and as inventors of technology, which are quintessentially human, <laughs> We should sustain our aspirations, otherwise they risk to remain a pie in the sky. It looks good, but uh, it's not for us to, to have it. So, and if you look at these um, um, uh, uh, technological barriers, uh, we just have to go no farther than the famous blockchain trilemma, which stated until a few months ago that at most two of the following three properties, security, decentralization, and scalability, were to be had. Just imagine if this were true, um, fortunately, it would not be accepted at all. And fortunately, it's actually false. And by the way, um, if, uh, what is the truth? The truth is that uh, if you are faced with this trilemma, who is going to suffer? Decentralization, because who wants a, a, an insecure blockchain? Nobody. Who wants to have a blockchain that can be used only between friends and family? Nobody. So when a push comes to shove, what do you think is going to be sacrificed? The very decentralization, which is our core of our aspiration. And by the way, aspirations are fine, but decentralization needs, truly needs a technology. So what is the problem? Do we need technology for building the chain? Well, we need the prehistoric cryptographic technology. I mean, uh, pre defined prehistoric and existing 50 years ago the technology. You just take the hash of a previous block, you make part of a previous block, done. All 2,900 cryptocurrencies out there, they just do the same thing. So what is the problem? The problem is choosing the next block. Who should choose the next block? And you know, in, uh, in uh, uh, proof of work, a great idea, but also a first idea. You know, we are going to have a computational uh, game, a computational riddle. Whoever funds it first has the right to append his or a block to the blockchain. But it's great because you know, we don't assign people, but we say anybody in principle could participate. But guess what? It's very expensive, hits the planet. We don't want that, particularly in days like today. And, um, and by the way, um, de facto centralizes the system because of the, the blockchain of Bitcoin now is in the hands of uh, uh, free miners, which uh, is this decentralized? I don't think so. In delegated proof of stake, it's a little bit uh, easier to see the, re the reaction, but the pendulum swings the other way. This time, you know, we don't even try to be decentralized. We just assign to, say, 21 people the right to choose the block on behalf of all of us. Is this, uh, you know, at least one thing is to become centralized de facto as a, a side product of a, of a good intent, and the other stuff is to start being centralized to begin with. I don't think it is a good idea. And bonded proof of stake, similarly. So to make a long story short, what is a, 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 the core problem that we see here in, in these approaches? That the whole economy is as a mercy of a small corner of the economy. Who is this small corner? In proof of work are the miners. Now, in the whole global GDP, what fraction of the economy, the world economy, is represented by the miners? You not only need the magnifying glasses, you need more of an electronic microscope to see the miners, right? So it is a bizarre approach to give them so much power. And in delegated proof of stake are the delegates and so on and so forth. So instead, uh, so what uh, we, uh, we try to, be to have a different technology, we call it the pure proof of stake, which is uh, defined as follows, very at a high level, money is always at your fingertip, where it should be, or invested in various opportunities the blockchain offers you. And when you consider all the money in the system, wherever it wants to be, invested, not invested in your, in your wallet, 
and even majority of, of the money is in honest hands, the system works. Another way to put it, the only, the only ones who can somehow corrupt you know, uh, uh, the Algorand blockchain is really a majority of the money. Uh, and uh, they must first collude and then shoot themselves in the foot and, and, and collapse the very economy of which they own a majority of. So in my opinion, that is a little bit you know, um, a better design. And um, again, at a very high level, uh, uh, blocks production is uh, delegated to the ever-changing committee. So one, uh, uh, who are these committees? These are uh, a thousand uh, uh, tokens are uh, somehow randomly selected. We need technology for that. And then they must belong to somebody. The owners of these uh, tokens are the committee. They produce uh, uh, one block. Next block, another uh, committee, and so on and so forth. And by the way, if you are selected, if one of your tokens is selected, what do you have to do? To propagate a very short and easy to compute message. So let's do a sanity check and then we continue with a new technology and somehow who, call, who selects the committee? Let them be assured that it's not me okay, because otherwise I'll be uh, extremely centralized. And so um, the committee members actually secretly select themselves, which uh, sounds a bad idea because if I'm bad, I select myself all the time. But in reality, what does this mean? That uh, each one of us inside the privacy of our own laptops because you don't need more than a laptop to do this uh, self-selection, you run an individual loader without talking to anybody. Think about uh, pulling the lever of a very easy um, slot machine, but uh, which implements a cryptographically fair lottery. What does it mean? That not even a nation state with huge computational resources can enhance the ability to be selected. So you pull the lever, if you are somehow uh, selected, you get a winning ticket, which is a proof that you are part of this committee and you propagate this proof together with your opinion about the block. That's roughly how it works. Now, why is this decentralized? Because again, we are not putting a thousand people in charge of selecting every block for the next month or week or day or hour, but somehow one block, one committee, another block, another, another committee. Why is this scalable? Because uh, how long does it take uh, to pull the lever in terms of computation? One microsecond of computation, that's pretty good. And then the propagation of a short message that scales. Why is this secure? Because even if I, if I were a very tough and powerful bad guy, who can corrupt any 1,000 people that I want instantaneously, I have a problem. I don't know whom I to corrupt. Because I, can, I do not know who is winning inside of your private computer this lottery. But once you figure out if you win or not, and you propagate your winning ticket and your opinion about the block, now I know who you are and I can corrupt instantaneously. But so what? Whatever you have said is virally propagated across the network, and I cannot put it back in the bottle no more than any government can put back into the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. So the system is secure roughly because beforehand I don't know whom to corrupt, and an ex post is a bit too late to corrupt. And so I bet in some sense how the system actually, the trilemma is solved. And so far this is a recapture of what is the core technology. There is more of course that I, I could uh, summarize uh, in, uh, in these uh, 10 minutes. And, uh, but one thing that is important is that by proceeding in this manner, the algorithm uh, fork chain, uh, um, 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 blockchain does not fork. Okay, happy with this, what is coming? What is coming now layer one technology and what is this? This is a, um, somehow uh, the ability to issue your own token at a layer one. In Ethereum, for instance, you do it as a, as a, uh, as a smart contract. And you know what smart contract is about. It's about expense, slowness, and uh, error prone, uh, and so on and so forth. Layer one is the same security la layer than the consensus protocol, so it's much easier. So anyone can issue uh, his or her own token, fungible or non-fungible, and without needs of smart contracts. And uh, what else is there? After giving the ability to issue your own tokens and, 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 and assets, or put assets on the chain, we give you layer one ability to somehow manipulate and, uh, and trade these, these assets. And so that me, uh, this layer one smart contracts are very simple program, but somehow they are capable of handling most of the need is smart contracts at a layer one. So 
at the same simplicity as making a payment. Who said so? Well, I do, okay, so we <laughs> can talk a little bit. And so let's focus on this, because there is no time for the, for the assets, just a layer one smart contract. And once we focus on it, they come into the variety, atomic transfers and till scripts. Atomic transfers are grouped transactions for simultaneous executions. We believe that these are so important that we somehow prepare them for you just, uh, um, just uh, on an individual basis. And till scripts are custom writable layer one contracts that you can actually uh, do yourself. In, for lack of time, let me focus on atomic transfers. And uh, here is in fact the focus. What is the simple stamp transfer? It's a swap, okay? And this swap, by the way, this time, which is rather than being atomic in name, is going to be truly atomic, really atomic, atomic swap, or lock free atomic swaps. So what is a swap? Two users, I have an asset you want, you have an asset that I want, one of the assets can be money, we want to trade an asset for money or, or whatever. And, um, and here is what, what we want to do if we want to do it without intermediaries, trusted intermediary. Somehow, think of it conceptually works as follows. So both you and I sign a pair. My asset from my key to your key and your asset from your key to my key. My signature alone has, has no um, jurisdiction on this pair and your signature alone is not. But together we have these things, but we must present also to the poor verifier, remember that is a layer one of the network, somehow a proof that we know these assets. So once I see the proof, and when you see that the joint declaration at a conceptual level, what I'm going to do if I'm a, a block proposer or a, I have a verifier of a block, I'm saying, yo, this, kind, this transfer is okay, and I post it on the blockchain. So roughly, at a high level, this is how it works. Let me look at the advantages. This is a single transaction. By the way, to avoid the smart contracts, because they are dangerous, uh, slow, and expensive, what do we do? We do a Nash time block to implement a transfer, which means I transfer something to you, but temporarily. You have an hour to transfer to me what I want. If you do not want, I have time to put a, a blockage, an, an abort transaction on the blockchain, right? And so what's the problem with that? That's an hour is not exactly instantaneous. The system is not atomic because as a many moving parts, totally disjoint. And second of all, if I'm bad, a bad guy, and after you transfer me your house, I start a denial of service attack against you. So that you cannot get any more messages or post any more messages. I want to see you posting an abort transaction. Thank you for the house, bye bye. So that's why if you want to be prudent, you want to take a day or two days or three days, depending on the value of the asset, to make sure the denial of service attack becomes too expensive relative to the asset you want to transfer. Here is a single transaction. So if a single transaction gets into the blockchain, our assets have been swapped. If it doesn't, because I'm denial of service or you're denial of service, who cares? I keep my asset, you keep your asset. Nobody has lost anything. And no cheating is possible. So layer one is actually very fast and very, and very secure. There is no error of a complication or too incomplete uh, um, 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 uh, programs. And in my opinion, that is how uh, transactions really need to be, the next generation of, of trading, because it's such a basic effort. And the same thing, by the way, on these uh, multi, uh, of, of atomic transfers are about a multi-party. Assume there are multiple transfers in multiple currencies, uh, red currency, uh, blue currency, uh, green currency, etc., etc., all these payments had to be done simultaneously. Who wants to pay first? Nobody, right? But you want to do these things simultaneously? Done. Again, everything thing here is propagated individually, but they are actually executed only simultaneously. So I know that when I push the button to do my own job, I know that my payment is not going to go anywhere, posted anywhere, unless all of us together can be done. And in a few seconds, if we want to this done, it will be done. Again, the advantages, single transaction, no cheating, layer one, no errors or smart contracts and complications like this. And so, by the way, that is a little bit of ASC um, Algorand smart contract and layer one strategy, is to have a set of rich set of ready-made 
thoroughly checked and optimized templates from which most probably you find what you want to do. And if you don't find it is much easier to put together two pieces to do the thing that you really want to do rather than starting hiring somebody to do uh, a smart contract uh, and good luck. And I believe that you know, things like this are really what are going to power a frictionless and democratize finance, which in my opinion should continue to be one of our goals because we have many goals, but somehow financial independence should be one because otherwise freedom without financial independence doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make many people really free. Okay, so what else? What, the next thing is this hybrid chain technology. So, I mean, I'm passionate about the permissionless blockchain. I think it is one of the most challenging and socially interesting uh, and, and crucial aspects uh, uh, for the world to have. Essentially, a permissionless blockchain gives you the ground truth on which nothing else can be constructed if you don't have a ground truth. But, you know, everybody also needs a, a permission um, a, a private chain anyway. So when I go in the street, I'm my public persona. I go back in my, ha in my house, hopefully I'm a private persona. And if I have my kids and I want to keep them aside for what uh, my wife and I have our own private conversation and so on and so forth. So the queer question is, how do we, what should we do? Should we have a coexistence? I think we need better than coexistence. We need the synergy between the two. And uh, let me explain what this does. There are two ideas here, one or two architectures. One is co-chains and one is uh, virtual chains. Co-chains means you run your own algorithm consensus algorithm and you interact with everybody else. And the virtual chains, in fact, you say, well, once you have your, your uh, I create my own space inside the, the algorithm co-chain, I don't need to have uh, all kinds of uh, architecture distributed around the world. Thank you very much. For lack of time, let me focus just on co-chain. First of all, notice the, the name, right? So it's not a sub-chain who wants to be sub of anything. And it's not even a side-chain, which is either. It's a co-chain, so we're talking about equal. So a co-chain essentially is his own master. So he runs his own consensus algorithm. Is a private, uh, private outside. Nobody sees the transaction, that are, but actually transparent inside. And uh, once you do their algorithm, we recommend, I recommend, making sense to consider Algorand. Why? Because, again, um, uh, Algorand allows you scalability to billions of, of, um, of, uh, of verifiers, if you so want. You, you may envision only 12 verifiers now, maybe uh, later on 100, later on 1,000. But you know what? You know, um, <laughs> you never know how much is going to be distributed on your co-chain. And so if you have something that scales to the billions, you don't care. Finally, you may actually like it because of no forks to run inside, because why should you have a fork even inside a, a private chain? And then you have always a rich, a, rich layer, a rich set of layer one functionality. Atomic swaps, I think you, they are good whether a chain is public or private, and all these other uh, things. But most of all, you need immediate cross-chain interoperability. So let me explain by um, a faster uh, picture. And um, assume that there is a, a blue chain which is permission. There is a red chain, also permission, and there is an algorithm chain which is permissionless, right? Somehow, I live in the blue chain, but I discovered that you have a very attractive uh, uh, circle, and I have a very attractive triangle to you. So we want to swap them. So what we want to do is that, first of all, we start in this situation. Now, internally, I transfer it to my own private key, which I can make one ad hoc for privacy reasons. And I own the triangle. I give it to Silvio, pub, blue Silvio public key, this triangle. And this appears in the block, uh, 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 unshielded, uh, that I'm transferring inside to this public key from the blue chain. And you do similarly with the circle. Then somehow I provide the algorithm chain, listen, the blue circle, as, which was uh, the triangle, which was in the blue chain, has now been assigned to key Silvio blue to algorithm. And once you receive a proof of this transfer, you actually transfer to the, the key blue Silvio. But the key blue Silvio, I never heard of this key. That's the beauty and the importance of a permissionless chain, where any transaction can create a chain and provide assets. 
Now, by magic, this blue Silvio is a key of the algorithm chain because it's permissionless and owns the triangle. And you also own your own key in algorithm uh, the circle. And then I just discovered what we have a technology for swapping. That is 4.5 seconds, you swap it. And then you transfer it back, and now at that point, this asset is removed from the algorithm blockchain, and now everybody knows that the circle belongs to somebody in the blue chain who knows whom, and the triangle belongs to the red blockchain who knows whom, but that prevents me to transact directly with you and sell the triangle to you, the same triangle to somebody else, because that's why having a public permissionless chain in the middle allows of this double spending between private co-chains. And uh, by the way, I really think that that's the way in which we operate because we both have a public and public persona and uh, we also want to have a, be, have a yearning for transparency, but we need to interact with each other. Okay, so far that's what I'm describing with future technology. The next one is um, uh, somehow having a smart chain technology and um, uh, two incomplete smart contracts, but done in a different way. We call them smart square contracts, smart contracts that now finally are really smart with a general point. But you know what? There is no time for that. And uh, there is going to be instead you know, some timeline. You know, the, the chain was launched you know, and has been uh, working flawlessly since uh, June. With layer one technology, all the uh, layer one smart contracts uh, and asset creation, uh, they will be on chain this November. These are uh, in uh, uh, next year. And uh, whatever we are planning for <laughs> to do, uh, stay tuned, uh, uh, cool stuff is going to come later. So my take is technology is quintessentially human. So all this notion that is human against tech. No, humans invent tools. We, that's what it means to be human. And technology is quintessentially humans. And technology all ought to serve humanity. Our aspirations will be realized by technology. And only true technology will let us be really who we want to be. Thank you very much. <laughs>